We want, we've been talking a little bit about humility and about what all that means. And so the passage that Dave has read to us this morning about being humble, it talks here, as Peter writes, uh, from the point of view of one of the elders. And in the first part of this passage, he writes about this fact that he is one of the elders and he writes to fellow elders, and so he gives them a charge that they are to shepherd the flock, that they are to be the shepherds. But there's a way in which he wants them to do that. And the way in which he wants them to do that suggests humility. He doesn't use the word, but he suggests it because he wants you to exercise oversight willingly, earnestly, by example, And all of those are a way in which someone would do it. He says, I don't want you to feel like you have to do it. I don't want it to be for any kind of financial gain or domineering over them. This is to be an opportunity for you, something you're able to do. And so shepherd like a shepherd, not like a boss. And that's what he gives to them. And then the passage here, in, in, starting in verse 5, is to the rest of us. Okay, there, we have only six elders, so that was your sermon. Now the rest of us, okay, he gives us much more where he says, I want you guys to be humble and to recognize your shepherds, to recognize that they are over you, for you to be humble to them and put yourself purposely underneath them and everyone else in the room. Okay? Because that's what the words are, to exercise humility toward one another. Well, not just this side, or not just that side, but toward everybody. And so it's not only toward the elders, which would be an obvious choice here, but it's toward everyone. He wants to clothe yourself with humility toward everyone. And then he comes with, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And the humble will take the grace. The humble will need the grace. The proud probably don't even think they need grace because, after all, they've got it all figured out. And so they already know how to do all of that. And so he then talks to them about this whole concept of what humility means. He says, I want you to humble yourself so that God can exalt. And we'll talk about exalting a little bit more next time. And then put all your anxieties on God. All your anxieties. Not just a little bit, not just a few of them, not just the biggest ones. Put all your anxieties on God because He's the one who cares for you. He's the one who takes care of you. Well, how do we do that? And obviously the first way is by humbling yourself before God and before other people. We need to trust God to be able to take care of us. We need to trust that God is going to be able to handle this, no matter what happens, that God is going to know how to do this. And that's kind of hard right now because we don't all think that it's going to work out. At least we don't know because it's not familiar. It's not the way it used to be. And you know how you're more tentative when you're in a certain place and you're not familiar with it. I know my car is on automatic. When I pull out of the driveway, it goes to the office. I don't know why, but it just does that. And if I'm going any other place, I'm halfway to the office before I figure out, oh, I shouldn't have turned here. I should have turned somewhere else. Because our lives get to be where we can go on automatic just fine. And we can work with that, and we know how to live our life and do until somebody upsets everything. And then it's no longer the same. It's no longer like it used to be. And then how are we supposed to do it? And when we're driving in a new place, we don't quite know where the turn is. We don't know, quite know where the street is. And we think our GPS is wrong. It is telling us the wrong direction. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. Mine is wrong a lot. When we start thinking about this idea of making other people over us, placing ourselves under them, or just being humble, it is much harder to do. 
I think there are several ways in which we need to think about this. First of all, we've talked about someone who's greater, that we need to be humble before God. And that's kind of where we started all of this. And so, yes, we need to recognize that God is greater. And that's an easy one to do because God is so much bigger. And He's so much greater in every single way, in qualities, in love, in power, in strength, in might, in every single thing that we can think of. Uh, just, you know, He's taller than you, okay? Uh, he's stronger than you. He's in every single thing. He is superior to you. And so it's not too hard to realize I can't create anything. And so I guess I'll admit that God's better than me. And if he's smarter than me, maybe I need to say he's got a better solution than me. To not be humble before God is just rebellion. I mean, you're just not even recognizing the facts of things. You're just not believing in God whatsoever because God is greater than anything possible. And so it's easier when there is a huge distance between us and someone else. It's not so easy when there is a small distance between us and someone else. Or if we're even or they're ahead They just think they're ahead, right? It's not really that they're ahead. And so if it's only a small distance, it's harder. So we might think it's easier if we're a lot bigger, right? We're able to use that. We're able to do this. We can go ahead and humble ourselves. Who do you think's going to win? Well, it depends on how nice the dad is, right? Uh, sometimes you're going to let your child win all the time. And so he's going to think he's the biggest. He's going to think he's the strongest. And it's not a threat to us at all. Because after all, I mean, you already know you could do that easily. And so because the distance is so great, okay, I'm going to let him win every time. Not a problem. When it gets down to who's the strongest and you're just about even you're not going to let him win. Especially when they turn into teenagers, because then they're going to brag about it a lot. And so you're not going to let him win then. You're going to have to try to win, and you're going to have to try and do things. And so anytime we get into that kind of competition, we have trouble with that. If the other guy is 1% better looking than you are, well, you just don't want to admit that. Or if he's one-tenth of a second faster. Well, do you really want to say that he's faster? Uh, We'll give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, which means you lose, right? And so the closer that gap is, the more we resist is. Anybody heard of Infinite Tucker? He's on the news in the last couple of weeks. He's the guy running for Texas A&M. He is a hurdler who won the 400-meter hurdle. He beat Robert Grant. Here is the photo finish. He got to the end. They were dead heat, neck and neck, fast as they could go. And he jumped and cleared probably five meters, they said. And you can see kind of the photo finish where the numbers are. Here's another view from the other side. He is clearly the winner just ahead. The other guy's leaning forward like this, but that's no excuse for this, especially if you're flying through the air. And they declared him the winner. Well, would you be upset at that? Well, you can't do that. Well, why not? Does anybody say that's against the rules? You can't do a Superman jump across? I mean, logic says that's a hard track and you're going to have to land somewhere. But, you know, uh, after the injuries, you realize you have won. And so this guy actually won the race. I don't know if he would have won normally or not. But he won the race because of this kind of move. Well, is that going to cause us to be a little bit you know, upset about it or a little bit worried about it? Shouldn't. So there's the photo. He won. No doubt about it. 
And then we should talk about elections when he just barely wins, right? Or maybe we shouldn't talk about elections when he just barely wins. How long are we going to argue about that one? When can you be humble and say, I lost? When we are even or barely superior, it is hard to be humble then. Because we don't recognize it as a fact. It's not the truth. And we're humble when we're less and we're recognizing a fact in the truth. And if it's just a very small margin, then, well, we're faster or better looking or smarter or, you know, how do you measure those things anyway? Why would we be humble in the first place? Why would we be humble if somebody else is clearly better than we are? Well, that's easy. Why would we be humble if they are not better, if they are clearly worse than we are? Well, because we're, you know, trying to encourage them. And if it's just a little bit, it's because we choose to. We choose to be humble. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Let's look at the example of Jesus, and I want to share some of this with you today. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5, we've looked at this, and so we're not going to spend much time with it. Here Paul writes, he says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so Jesus did away with his identity as Son of God, did away with some of his power as absolute God and his superior ability in order to become like us, in order to live this life exactly like us. And he became like us with our limitations, with our weaknesses, with him not being rich, with him not being powerful. Yes, he could do miracles for other people. He doesn't do it for himself. And he took no advantage in our world. And so let me just ask you about this, because there's a couple of different ways to look at this. Because Jesus could come and he could be here, but still know that he's God, right? Did he really humble himself? And so here's the way perhaps we can do this. When you play games with your children, who wins? How do you decide who's going to win? Is it by how hard you play? The parent plays with the child. The child gets to make up the game. The child usually makes up a game where they're going to win, right? And so you play along with the game and they're going to win. doesn't matter what the game is. But the parent is still the parent, right? And you're still going to fix dinner and you're still going to provide and you're still going to do things for them and you're still going to... So if it gets really touchy and bothers you, you can just pull rank and say, oh, well, we got to quit playing now. Well, who told you you could quit playing now? And you just stop the whole process, right? In order for you to be the child and to do what Jesus did, you will not stop playing now because you are under the child. And the child absolutely, completely controls the game until he releases you. Be assured you will not win over and over until they are finished and get tired of beating you, however long that's going to take. It may take days or weeks. If there are consequences, then what happens? Well, if there's consequences, then we step in because after all, we're the parent. We're going to protect them, right? Because isn't that what we have to do? Not with what Jesus did. If there are consequences, we are going to let the child have the consequences. It's a way in which they would learn the best, 
Because after all, you don't just get to get in the middle and say, oh, I'm going to be in charge, and then all of a sudden, well, no, I'm not in charge anymore. You go ahead. So if you're camping in the backyard and it starts to rain, you don't come in till the child says. Because the child is in charge, the child is the one who says, and you are going to put yourself under them. That's what Jesus did. He did not exercise authority and say, oh, but you're doing it wrong and this is going to turn out badly and so I'm just going to step in. No. When we humble ourselves under someone else, there may be a time like this where we are not going to take our own authority, where we are going to let them do this. And why would we ever do this? This does three things. One, it lets you experience or lets the child experience it like it really is. It lets us experience it like it really is. What is it like to be a child? Have we forgotten? But we might remember then. It lets the child really be in charge. And number three, it forces them to learn from their own decisions. And if we're constantly jumping in to bail them out and constantly jumping in to take care of things and to manage things for them whenever it gets sticky, no, they're never going to learn how. And so part of humility is to say, I'm going to let you be in charge of me. I'm going to let you be in charge of this situation. I'm going to let you take this role. And I am not going to jump in the middle of it, even when it's messing up, even when it's not going well, even when things are falling apart, because you're never going to learn to do it unless you have it. And that is what Jesus did. He came and he was here. So how did he accomplish all of these things? Jesus comes to earth And he is just like us. Well, he has these great powers, though. He can heal. Yes. He can heal. And he is always superior in every way until he humbles himself under us. And he is humble with the sick and the distressed. And says, what do you want me to do for you? And they say, I want to be healed of my leprosy. And Jesus touches leprosy. That's playing the game. That's figuring out what it's like to be here. That's touching the guy who's in quarantine with COVID that nobody else can touch because he is not going to go above him. And when he's in trouble, he stood with them against the Pharisees, the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath day. It's a setup. You know it's a setup. And Jesus says, I'm going to heal you. And he becomes the outcast just like the man on the Sabbath day. And he could heal with more power from God, and God is there working through him the same way God works through prayer with us. Because it's possible with prayer. And sometimes he doesn't heal. He doesn't heal Lazarus. Because there's a bigger miracle at stake and greater teaching at stake. Let me show you what resurrection looks like. And so he allows humility and even Lazarus' humility to teach a greater lesson. And it says also that he died on the cross as one of us, the nails hurt, the beating was real, and he didn't answer back, and he didn't defend himself, and he was right. Every single bit of the way, he was right, and he was pure, and he was holy, and he was above all of this. He was innocent. 
And he took the punishment of a guilty person because he humbled himself with us so that we might receive his forgiveness. He taught as one of us. He trained disciples as one of us. He followed every single command he ever made. That's how you tell the difference between the boss and the guy who humbles himself. The boss makes rules he doesn't have to keep. The guy who humbles himself keeps every single one of his rules. Because if I made it for you, I'm going to follow it. I'm going to keep it. And he called them and he taught them what he wanted to be. And he comes to be with us and he comes to bless us when we are wrong. Absolutely wrong. And he doesn't really point it out. He says, don't sin anymore. We already know it's wrong. He's not leaving any doubt that it's wrong. And if there ever was a doubt, surely he would point that out. But he's not trying to make a big spectacle of that. He's humbling himself with us in our sin. He says, you don't need to do this anymore. And we're like, I know. It was a mistake. When we are inferior, he doesn't notice. Because he already knows we are. And he's there to help. And he's there to support us. And he leads from being like us, not from being over us. Maybe the best example of all of this, and I know these are familiar stories, is in John 13, as we look at Jesus and what he did. And I love the first part of this because it's what Jesus knows, and it's that he knows all of these huge things. And so starting in John 13, 1, he says, Now, Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During the supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from the supper, He laid aside his outer garment, and taking a towel, he tied it around his waist, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And so just notice the things that Jesus knows when he knows his hour has come, when he knows he is departing out of this world and going to the Father. He knows about Judas. He knows about the betrayal. He knows the Father's given all things into his hands. He knows he came from God. He knows he's going back to God. And then he just starts. Nobody else has moved. We all got here. We're all just sitting here, dirty footed. And he just gets up and starts. He humbles himself. And it's not with a big exasperated sigh or a mumble under his breath. (sighs) You guys' feet stink, but I guess I'm going to have to just do it. That's not humbling yourself, okay? That's the form of control in everybody else and trying to get them to do what you're forcing them to do. No, quiet, silent gets his water, comes over and starts on the first one. He'll make his point later on. He doesn't have to make it right then. He's doing what they should have done. He's acting like one of them should have. But he's humbling himself to be that one who should have. And showing them, here's the example of what it would look like if one of you were humble like this. And so he's going to teach the lesson, not like the schoolmaster with authority who says, you ought to have washed feet. He's going to teach with the greater leadership skills of getting the point across rather than getting your way. And when he had washed their feet, Peter objects. Peter begins to argue, not me. He recognizes the irony. He says, well, yes, I am 
going to wash your feet or else you don't have any part with me. And of course, Peter's going to argue with everything. Jesus doesn't tend to argue with him. He just says, no, you're going to let this happen. And when he's finally done, he had washed their feet and he put on his outer garments and he resumed his place and he said to them, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord and you are right for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And so... He washes feet. You call me teacher and Lord. And you are right. I love that. I am teacher. I am Lord. I am the one who is that. It's not just a name you give me. That's what I am. But he speaks from the place of one who washes feet. And you ought to wash others' feet. Even if it's not your job. You hear that a lot? Well, that's not my job. That is the enemy of humility. No, nobody told me I have to do that. Exactly. And so we are not going to do anything that we are not absolutely have to do. And there is no humility in that. We're going to do it even when we're right and it doesn't need to be done. We're going to do it when they are wrong. Yeah, that's harder to do. But we're going to do it because we're humble, right? And if you let somebody else be in charge of it, it's the only way for them to learn anything and follow the pattern that Jesus is trying to set up here. Is you're going to be the one that does it. By being under, by being humble like this. Well, that kind of pushes the other person who's in charge of it to say, well, I thought you'd jump in. I thought you'd take over. And it just doesn't work like that. Even if you're smarter, even if you're better, even if you're faster, you're going to do it their way. Because they need to be able to do this. And because it's who you are. And the rest of the New Testament is how this works out. And you see people in charge, and you see people doing this. We need to know how to humbly lose better than anyone else. Opposite's true. We need to know how to humbly win better than anybody else as well. We are not greater than the Master at any time. All right, I was debating about a story. I guess I'll tell you this story. It's, I, I can remember being in junior high school and going to get Christmas presents. And this is back in the olden days, you know, just after they had got printed money. Uh, and I had saved up everything I could save. So I had a whopping like 15 bucks for Christmas for everybody. And so we're at Woolworths, a place that no longer exists. Uh, which had everything in the world. And my sister and I are there, and so we see this organ that she likes. And it's, you know, just a little tiny keyboard, but it does all kinds of stuff. And, you know, you can play a tune on it, and she's just so excited about this thing. It's 30 bucks. I'm like, wow, that's a lot of money, but it is her favorite thing. And so I decide... I am going to be the most generous person this year. And I am going to go ahead, and long before they ever had credit, I know most of you don't remember that, they had something called layaway. And so for about three bucks or five bucks, I could put this thing on layaway. And so I thought this is going to be great because I know what's going to happen. I can get this. It's really what she wants. And I'll go home and tell mom and dad and, you know, they'll chip in. 
And so put it on layaway, went home and said, man, I found the perfect thing for Judy. This is exactly what she wants. It'll be perfect. She loves this. It'll be great. And I went ahead and put it on layaway. And uh, they said, well, that's, that's fine. But I didn't get the second part of this. You know, I want the second part of this. It says, and uh, we'll pay half, right? Okay, half would be good. More than half would be even better. And so I'm waiting. And, you know, a few days go by. I says, well, you know, Judy really likes this. And I went and I put this on layaway for her. And uh, do you guys think you could chip in some? They went, well... You know, we don't want to give her your present. It's like, what? <laughs> I had to save for the rest of the time and spend everything that I had gotten just to make that barely out in time for Christmas. Why wouldn't they bail me out and help me? because I would never remember that story today. (laughs) Do not overcommit yourself to something you're not willing to do. And it took a hard lesson for me to understand that. But I was helping them out. I was the one who's going to know. Sometimes that's not helpful. And sometimes you just have to let the person do it because that's what they need to do. And they might need to learn some ways not to do it. So it doesn't commit everybody else around them and all of their resources as well. Those are hard lessons. But I think at that time, my parents said, you know what, we're going to let you handle this because this was your decision If you want to give her that much, we are proud of you, son. I think she played it for about a week or two and then never touched it again. (laughs) It's one of those things where you just learn your lesson, you know? And so I saw this this week. This is the Last Supper, but I saw this. If you're not humble, life will visit humbleness upon you. Or God will visit humbleness upon you. We just need to act like Jesus. Put everything under God. From the time of Jesus' baptism until the time of his ascension, everything went under God. Everything was God's will. Everything was the way God wanted it. Everything he did was to promote God. It's his will, his initiative, his word. He entrusted himself to God. And everything from the time of our baptism until now, all of our fears, all of our anxieties, all of our hopes, all of our dread, give it all to God. That's what humble means, is that you would put it all under God and let him take care of it and watch how he does. Because he really doesn't need your help. And sometimes when we try to help, it just overcommits us. Well, I can't fix the situation this morning in any of your lives. I wish I could. But I'm not sure I'd trust myself to do it, even if I could. So we can't fix it all. Church is a wonderful place, but it can't fix it all. But we can pray to God who does. So today, if we can pray for you, would you come while we stand and sing?